All right, this is going to be the most historically important episode of the Kiss Army Things podcast. And I know, I know, I said that very same thing a couple episodes ago on episode 101 when I had Charlie Sub on, but I meant it then and I meant it now, because on today's show we have, kind of, we have Paul Sub himself. This is Charlie's dad, the guy who owned the Popcorn Club, changed it to Coventry, and of course would give a lot of local New York kids a chance to play good original rock music, the New York Dolls, Joey Ramone, and of course Kiss had their first gig at the Coventry Club, and so I thought that, you know what, today I'm going to film on the other side of the room. Usually we film on that side, but since today is all about early KISS, I thought we would film on this side of the room. I have my Originals poster, I have my um, 1974 looking uh, KISS shirt, and so I thought we would just immerse ourselves in um, early KISS today, and since we're going to be talking all about that, this is an incredible opportunity. Um, I never thought that I would have the chance to interview Paul Sub, the man who opened and owned the Coventry Club. So thank you guys so much for watching this. Please like and subscribe. Leave your comments. This is going to be an incredible episode. It's going to be going beyond just rock and roll, okay? This is beyond history. This is going to be getting into world history, okay? I was not prepared for this, and so I'm so glad to be able to do this for you guys. And this is not going to be a regular interview. I will go ahead and say that. You can imagine that uh, at 93 years old, it was hard for... I'm not 93. Uh, Paul is 93. I'm not 93, but you're 16. Uh, no, that was a KISS reference to uh, going blind. Anyway, uh, Paul Sub is 93, and so you can imagine that at 93, it was hard to... Um, organize and conduct a normal in-person interview, kind of like I did with Charlie. So what I was able to do was submit my questions in and have Charlie read and then record Paul um, recording his answers. And so um, we're going to hear from the man himself. Uh, again, he is 93, so uh, the audio isn't the best at times. Um, it's hard to understand him a little bit. So what I did was I did my best to condense this down to boost the audio and even provide subtitles for everybody to read. So because um, I want everybody to really listen to this and follow along and, and, and pay attention because uh, there is more to it than just rock and roll. But yes, he is going to talk about the Coventry and yes, he is going to talk about Kiss. And so it's, it's going to be great. So I want you guys to join along here. And um, of course, the first question I wanted to ask was, you know, before we even talk about KISS and the Coventry, let's talk about you. So where were you born? What was your family and your childhood like? I was born in Vienna in 1930. My father was a pianist and a band leader in Austria. So I was always around music. He had his own orchestra, but two orchestras actually. Uh, that's where all of us got interested in the music. Is this because he was always doing something in the cafe that we owned in uh -huh. Vienna. And it was a beautiful city until we had the problem with the uh, war, where we were hiding under the table, all those things. We were mostly in hiding when we were in Vienna because of the war. And uh, most of the time, the father was still playing in different places. Basically, that was one of the reasons we were able to get away with not being slaughtered. And from there, we had a few incidents. When I was eight years old, and in the cafe, two big storm troopers came into the coffee shop. I was coming out, and they made me come out, and they asked me a very good question. You have something that you want to take one of your, your father or your mother? So it was very difficult for me to answer that question. <laughs> and so my mother volunteered, she went out. And luckily it was only to clean the sidewalk of the graffiti. That was one of the shocking things in my little life. The other one, there were a lot of them, but the, the other main one was a little later on when the stormtroopers came in, they would take all the men and they took my father on a truck with another 90 people take him to the gas chambers. Luckily, my father was known amongst these people there, and the were driver knew my father, so he threw him off the truck. When he fell off the truck, he lost part of his hearing. That was a horror my mother 
dragging me along. From there on, they were just basically hiding. And then uh, the other thing that I look at is that when the United States government had a big deal, about 40 people out of Austria to the United States. Mm -hmm. What happened was my father and was not amongst the poor. But my grandfather, my mother, my aunt, we were among the first twenty group to, you know, mm -hmm. to come to the States. And there was another twenty I had grandfather, uncle, and cousin, you know, Mr. Roosevelt, who I don't particularly care for, but uh, he cut out the other twenty people. He said only twenty are going to get out, not forty. Mm -hmm. the forty were paid for and everything. So, uh, then we escaped because of that. My father had to go to Shanghai, and my aunt, and few of them, my, my grandfather, and all the other relatives went to the gas chamber. I know that probably sounded like a lighthearted question, right? You know, tell us who you are, where you're from, and all that, but it was um, definitely not a lighthearted answer. And, you know, I wasn't um, expecting that you know, going into this, but yeah, you can imagine that as a 93 year old Jewish man, Paul Sub has seen some stuff in his life. He's been through a lot and suffered a lot. And so, um, I thought it was important to just kind of, you know, camp here for a second, you know, world war two has obviously shaped our world today. And we sometimes don't realize just how, you know, recent history this is. I mean, we still are hearing firsthand accounts from people who were there, and we even just celebrated D-Day earlier this month. I wouldn't say celebrated, um, remembered D-Day when, you know, the Allied forces landed on Normandy Beach, literally with the intention of ridding Europe from Hitler's regime. And, um, you know, this is just, again, it's um, fascinating stuff. It's um, awful stuff, but it's also more relevant to history than you would think. Um, I think we're all pretty well aware of Jean's mom and her accounts and her stories having been in concentration camps. I mean, she watched her mother and her grandmother enter the gas chambers. And we know that, you know, Paul Stanley's talked about how growing up all the adults around him had tattoos on their wrists, like it was just normal. Um, but have you ever heard of Brigadier General James Thayer? Did you guys know that Tommy Thayer's dad was serving as second lieutenant in World War II on behalf of America and was actually over in Europe? And I think his, I think he was supposed to be, he and his platoon, his troops, they were supposed to be looking for an ammunition dump. And instead, they came across one of the worst death camps uh, they could have ever imagined, you know, coming across. And according to Gene's findings and Gene's account, it's very likely that the camp that Tommy's dad helped liberate was that of Gene's mom. Now, I that obviously that can't be, you know, 100% verified. Oh, hey, our sons are going to grow up to be, you know, they're going to have a lot of fun together and do a lot of cool things. Obviously, you, you can't verify that. But it's just, again, World War II has shaped this um, entire, you know, modern history and all the way down to our favorite band. I was just stunned, and so I wanted to at least, you know, bring this to you guys' attention, and obviously I'm so glad to be able to be the one to share Paul's story. Paul's never done an interview like this in this capacity before. Um, I, I did find some really cool excerpts from, like, an interview with Ken Sharp, and then there was a KISS fan uh, named Roni Lundell who wrote an incredible article about the Coventry and Paul in the February 2023 issue of KISS Army Sweden. That was really awesome, but uh, to hear the stories from the man himself, I just thought this was absolutely incredible. And so um, I want to keep going here and talk about more about um, how he immigrated to the United States. And so my second question for Paul was, when did you and your family migrate to the United States, and what was your new life like in the Big Apple? Then we came to the United States about eight years old. We didn't, all well, our relatives were raising $5,000 per person with tariff. At oh. that time, $5,000, milk was two cents a quart. So you can imagine what $5,000 meant. The U.S., my father had already gone to Shanghai. The Jews didn't want to go to Shanghai. They were afraid of the Chinese. The Chinese were willing to let whoever wanted to come out. And the people themselves were afraid to come to China. Chinese were very, you know, anybody wants to come, come. 
Then Hitler yeah. should let it in. Yeah. After I just got on the plane and after uh -huh. I went into school in the Bronx, when we got to the United States. My father couldn't come to the United States because he was in Shanghai for about two, three years. He didn't come over until I think 1941 or something. He played the piano. That was for me and for friends and all that. But he never went back to it having a band. And my uncle survived. My aunt survived. My grandmother survived. They all came to the United States. So, uh, my father opened up a little dry goods store. He sold shirts, underwear, small ones. So, with that, he made a living. He worked 10 hours a day. My mother. And I would say seven days a week, and my father worked like that too, for one dollar a day. Not only the farm, but you know, you couldn't get jobs in those days. That's what they were paying, one dollar a day. But that was survival. So yeah, just in case we thought life was going to be smooth sailing now, it's not. It's not. You know, Paul's, I've noticed Paul's story is one of grit, determination, hard work, and, I mean, you heard it, survival. Um, I even, I got some um, additional notes here that he sent me in a text document. He says that he and his mother fled Austria to New York via the Netherlands aboard the SS Elsenstein uh, when he was eight, and they would have arrived at Ellis Island in New York in 1939. And um, he uh, was in the Bronx and then moved from the Bronx to Brooklyn and Brooklyn to Manhattan. He says here that Manhattan is where you would want to go for music entertainment, music type entertainment. And so now we're starting to get into, you know, his um, high school life and his young adult life. And so my third question was, your son described you as a serial entrepreneur. So talk about being a business owner in 1940s New York City. And what were some of the earlier businesses you owned before opening Coventry? So going back to the days now, whatever language you have to learn, you learn English, you learn it. You can't. You have to learn English because the store was, everybody was in Manhattan. The store was in Manhattan, but we lived in Brooklyn. I went to Lafayette High School. And then from there on, I had stayed in the business. I decided to open up a sandwich shop. My wife could take care of the store. And I went into the hero shop. We had eight hero shops. And the two of them, one of them was in the village. Mm -hmm. Both were in the village. And it was a sort of a coffee shop. That's where we started with having some entertainment. Tall player, this is in the village. Probably got a dollar. <laughs> so then we had comedy club and a little bit of music. That uh, comedy club he's talking about, he says, was a bar that lasted for about 10 years. And Bette Midler was the only person with any name recognition that would come there and perform. So um, it's cool. And we're going to hear some other, you know, big popular names too. So it's amazing to me how many, um, you know, popular names he had a hand in sort of, you know, letting them perform, letting them play or whatever it was, giving them a boost. And yet we know all these names, but we don't know Paul Subb's name. And so again, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we're all here getting to hear his story. He talks about um, some sub shops. He opened some sub shops, aptly named Subs. Paul Sub. It's a sub shop. His last name is Sub, so it's Subs Sub Shop. I think that was a um, pretty uh, pretty great name there. And then he says uh, Bob Dylan and Jody Mitchell would um, stop by and were regulars here. Of course, this is before anybody who anybody knew who those names were. Uh, Bob Dylan and Jody Mitchell. So at the time, they're just nobodies. They're just regulars. But again, to hear some of this cool rock and roll history um, is is super awesome. And he talks about in his notes here about how he had to, after his place in Manhattan sold, he was looking for um, another venue, a new place to open. And he says he found one in Queens Boulevard, on Queens Boulevard. And I think we all know what that is. So now we're getting in to the Coventry Club. And so I asked Paul, I said, tell us more about this iconic rock club. Why did you change the name from Popcorn to Coventry? And how did you promote shows? Our place was big. They had only maybe 800 people. Popcorn Club did the sound so good for the music. Then we changed the name to Coventry. More effective than the Popcorn. Yeah. Basically, they hung out. And uh, also, you know, 
music they liked at that time was the rock music. So like we said, oh, let's open up, change it into a rock club. And it made sense in a way, because it was, gave a lot of kids a break. I put ads in the first place. So like every weekend, we had like three or four different bands. Kiss was one of the bands that played there. And when they played there, they didn't have a customer. They had a manager. And he said, uh, I'm going to change him into something different. So now we're getting to the good stuff, man. This, this is absolutely incredible. So I mentioned advertising because I'm a graphic designer. And so I love, of course, you know, designing ads and making that kind of stuff, but also looking at ads, looking at old ads, especially, you know, kiss ads. And um, we all have heard of the village voice, but marketing, you know, nowadays it's all done digital, right? It's all computers and it's all, you know, LED screens and all that. So back in the day, it would have been print ads, right? Print advertising. And so you would just advertise in any local publication you could and hope for the best. And so um, I liked hearing, you know, Paul talk about some of that stuff, especially uh, getting into KISS. I didn't even ask about KISS yet. Um, and he's already talking about KISS. And he even mentions how they weren't wearing costumes. So even though I'm sure at 93, your memory can be a little hazy, he's clearly remembering, yeah, KISS, you know, these guys, they weren't wearing any costumes yet. They were just like any other band off the streets. So um, hearing that was was really cool, especially mentioning Bill Coin. He didn't mention Bill by name, but he mentions, you know, they were they had a manager, not all the bands had a managers, but these guys had a manager. And I can think back to him saying, you know, these guys are going to be something new, something big, something different. So um, hearing him recall that uh, conversation, I thought was absolutely brilliant, especially since I was looking at, again, some old ads in preparation for this episode. I was looking at some old ads of Kiss and on the ads pre Bill of Coin, because when they started playing the Coventry, it was obviously, you know, just Kiss as themselves. By the time they were done playing the Coventry, moving on to the big leagues, they obviously had management. And so you look at some of those pre coin ads, and it just has Kiss listed as one of the many glitter rock bands. All of a sudden, post Bill of Coin, now that Bill of Coin is their manager, their ads start reading like, you know, New York's Heavy Metal Masters or something like that. They start to differentiate themselves now with Bill as their manager. And so I like looking at those Coventry ads pre-Bill and post-Bill, and you can kind of see where... You know, like Paul was saying, Bill's looking to, you know, take these guys, take them to the next level. But um, we're getting ahead of ourselves now because, again, Kiss is still very, very new, and um, they just formed. And so I wanted to know, just quite frankly, you know, Paul, what was your first impression of Kiss, their music, and their image? Another group, but then they would have been recruited if they wanted. Without that, they would have been like the other people. You guys can imagine me sitting in a dark room with my headphones on, trying to, you know, listen real close and write this stuff down, type it out so I can transcribe it for you guys later. And hearing the bluntness of him, like, yeah, yeah, they weren't even that good. They were just bums off the street, you know, uh, was kind of refreshing because obviously 50 years on, we look at Kiss as like this revered, iconic band. And it's like, I mean, it's January 73. These guys literally just formed Kiss. Lydia Chris swears that KISS had been formed before Christmas of 72. Uh, if you read her book, I think she claims that KISS had already been formed by 72 in December. And, you know, here we are in January 73, KISS is playing their first shows. And, you know, to Paul Sub, the club owner, he's like, I've seen many acts come through here. They're just like everybody else. You know, nothing really special. So I loved the the bluntness of it there. This is a, this is a KISS uh, pre-Bill, you know, pre-Neil. Um, so I, I liked hearing his um, candidness. You know, he wasn't going to sugarcoat anything, and I really appreciated that. But I also wanted to press a little further, right? Okay, I wanted to know more, as much as he wanted to tell us about Kiss. Uh, so I asked him. I said, "Can you share any memories that you have of the band?" Maybe I think maybe we played four or five times, seven times. That's fifty dollars here for the hotel. Don't bring in fifty dollars for the customers. <laughs> That's a joke. I don't, I don't think I ever paid anybody. I couldn't pay anybody. You know, but it didn't take long. And about six months later, I went to $50,000 a night. All because they put on a costume. There were at least 100 bands that were as good as they were. Not, maybe not bad, but as good as they were. Right. They had the manager. 
that they didn't cut. They weren't a bad band, but they were all other bad, good bands too. Kiss goes and they made it tremendously well. Nice guy, it's very nice. In his notes, he says, you know, they seem to have good management at the time, which wasn't usually the case for other bands at their age range. So, you know, clearly, you know, Kiss, they were making moves and doing things that um, other people weren't. And it is true, you know, Kiss, they did not stay in the clubs for very long. Uh, I mean, they only played Coventry, like he said, you know, maybe seven or eight times. And I know someone's going to try and correct him when he was saying that, you know, oh, they went from you know, playing clubs to making 50 grand in just six months. And, you know, how does he know it was six months? Or how does he know what Kiss was making? He's just making a point that obviously, you know, Kiss was one of the bands that seemed to really shoot to the top very quickly. And he's not far off, though, because, you know, like I said, Kiss, you know, they were in the clubs pretty much all of 73. And that was it. I mean, I mean, they did return to the clubs, you know, do some club shows in the 80s and 90s and, you know, things like that. But as far as that initial club run... You know, January 73, they played Coventry, and then literally their last show at the Coventry was December 21st and 22nd. Their next show after that, New Year's Eve, December 31st, that was their first professional industry debut show at the Academy of Music. So first real show on a real stage. Bill gives them the big famous Light Up Kiss logo that we all know and love. And so, you know, they literally go from one week playing in the clubs to playing in the big leagues the next week in less than a year after being a band. So when you look at it like that, I mean, we talk about how Kiss, you know, they struggled there for a while in the beginning. And while that there is some truth to that, compared to some of the other bands, man, they were moving really quick. Moving really quick, making big moves, looking to get to that next level. And like we said, you know, they were treating themselves as if they were already on that next level. So I liked hearing uh, him talk uh, about all that stuff. And he mentions the band giving him albums and posters. He, He said, yeah, they gave me albums and posters and so the story goes that after a while you know Paul was feeling a little let down by some of the bands that he had play at his club you know he would see all these bands coming through playing moving on to the next level doing different things and never you know coming back to say thanks or you know never coming back to you know perform again or anything there there was no gratitude there was no thankfulness it was almost like he felt like these bands were just using him as a stepping stone you know and so that kind of bothered him and at one point he actually rented out or bought space in village voice to vent his feelings and say look if it continues this way i'm gonna have no choice but to completely change course do something else and the rock and roll stuff you know see ya bye it's done um so i think you know it really bothered him that bands like kiss would reach success and then not even, you know, bother to shake his hand and say thank you, we appreciate it, or come back, or anything like that. Uh, and eventually, uh, it did happen. Uh, Coventry closed, I think, in May of 75. Um, they had a big blowout party. And even though Kiss did not come back and, you know, they didn't return or anything, they did get wind of this and at least send Paul, I think, maybe 25 Kiss records to be raffled off and sent, like, a signed autograph poster, which he hung up on the wall he said the poster got stolen the next day so that's unfortunate but i think that was good for him because he finally felt like kiss was getting back in a way or at least acknowledging you know their time at the coventry and life of course is you know it's all about perspective you know because from his perspective yeah kiss they come in they're nobodies off the street and then you know two years later they have you know kiss alive one of the biggest albums and it kind of you know bothered him that they weren't you know, giving him the credit that he felt like he deserved in a sense like, hey, thank you for giving us a chance. You let us play original rock music. Um, But from Kiss's perspective, obviously, having made it to the big leagues, they don't want to look back, right? You know, they don't want to look back at the the slummy club days. As a matter of fact, there was a little audio snippet. I didn't get to use it here, but there was a snippet. uh, You can hear it on the Patreon. I'll have the full uncut interview on Patreon if you want. But there was a, a a part where he said, yeah, I heard that Kiss had mentioned playing at the club, uh, playing at Coventry, and they weren't that nice about it when they talked about how slummy it was. And, you know, you could tell in his voice that that, that bothered him. You know, I'm doing my best to give you local kids a place to play original music, and you go on to make it big, and then 
say some not so nice things. So I think that bothered him a little bit on one hand. Whereas again, you know, it's all about perspective life from his perspective. You know, he was like, well, why aren't these guys giving me the thanks that I think I'm due? Whereas kiss, they're like, we don't really want to look back at our club day. So we're hearing two sides of the same coin, which uh, again, is absolutely fascinating. So now that we've talked a lot about kiss and heard about kiss, I wanted to talk more about just the local rock scene in general. Right, because Kiss obviously was the band that made it out of that New York scene, made it to the big leagues, and stayed in the big leagues. But there were plenty of other rock bands happening at this time and playing. So I wanted to hear more from him about the local rock scene. I said, talk to us about this local New York rock scene in the early 1970s. What were some of your other favorite groups that were coming through? My favorite band was uh, the Ramones group. New York Dolls. Dolls. Those were my favorite bands. Of course, they brought in a lot of people. And there were a lot of other good bands. The ISIS was a lot of people. Well, that happened for a while, and the rock sort of died out. And that was successful. Rock was about two years. Then it sort of uh, couldn't get any people to come in. Kiss already was gone, because Kiss was not going to play for me. <laughs> And then Dolls, the two groups paid to rent. I had the biggest rock band in the world. You can hear the pride in his voice right there at the end. I had the biggest rock bands in the world. I That put a big smile on my face. Uh, I think the Ramones played at like the second incarnation of Coventry Club, but Joey Ramone, before he was in the Ramones, was playing with his band Sniper um, at the Coventry Club. And so... Yeah, you can tell that um, he's very fond of these groups. And I even read where um, it may have been over 300 bands that had played there in just the few years that Coventry was open. That is a lot. That is staggering. Oftentimes, you know, I mean, it was a full bill on the weekends, but you would have bands like Kiss, you know, who were kind of nobody at the time playing in the middle of the week, three, four, sometimes five or more acts. Um Anybody who wanted to play was allowed to play. And I think that right there is one of the things that separates Paul Sub from a lot of the other promoters in New York around that time was that he was allowing people, bands and artists, and encouraging them to play original music. All the other places um, in and around that area, you know, they were strictly cover bands, top 40 hits. And because those, you know, of course, brought in the most business, the most money. And so, I mean, maybe it would have worked out for Paul Sub to have had cover bands come in and play top 40 hits. Even Sid Benjamin, right? The owner of the Daisy. We've all seen that famous photo of Kiss with Sid from the Daisy. You know, it was guys like Paul and Sid who were, you know, really adamant about original music. And even though, yes, it didn't bring in the most business, their clubs were not the nicest clubs in town. You know, it still did um, a lot of good for those. I mean, look how much good it did for bands like Kiss you know, who strived to be different, um, even if he wasn't, you know, making the most money. Um, it wasn't until Coventry became a Latin dance hall where he started to make some actual money and see some real success. But uh, the last thing I wanted to ask him, and I didn't get this on audio, but I did get it in writing. And I had heard during, you know, through research that one of the bands he actually turned down from playing Coventry was Aerosmith. Again, Aerosmith. I mean, how many, you know, who are the two biggest American rock bands in the world? Kiss and Aerosmith. It's always it's always been a fight between those two, right? And so here we are, Paul Sub. I'm the guy that likes to have people come play original music, but yet Aerosmith gets turned down. So I wanted to inquire, why did Aerosmith get turned down? And he actually says, well, I'm a businessman first, and they wanted travel money. And I didn't want to start off with that. We already had lots of great bands locally at the time, so... I just said no. And that was interesting to me, the fact that Aerosmith, you know, they wanted travel money to come play at the Coventry. And Paul's like, I'm not even making enough money to, you know, pay for my own bills. Why am I paying you guys? You know, that joke earlier he said about Kiss, you know, you guys don't even bring in 50 bucks worth of customers. So, you know, I thought it was interesting that a band like Aerosmith wanted to, you know, wanted travel money. But uh, anyway, yeah, I was thinking it was going to be more of a, you know, rock and roll story, but it was very business, strictly business. This is the music business. And so, yeah, they wanted travel money. I didn't want to even start with that. We already had great local bands, so why even bother? I can respect that. 
I can respect that. The last question I wanted to ask, and this one, of course, had to be the last question, right? You've had a lot of experience in life and a lot of success. What is the best piece of advice that you would give me or anybody listening right now? Be as detailed or as specific as you wish. If you like music, come into the music business and make sure you can afford it. But it's got to be afforded because it's going to take a long time to make a dollar. I mean, you just can't become, you know, a big star if you are not a good musician. In the music business, if it's a field that you enjoy, it's what you should be doing. In your life, do what you like to do. And if you do something that you're doing because you have to do it for the dollar or two, you have a choice of doing something with heart desires. Don't take the money. Take the pleasure. I like that. I like that. That is that is some solid advice. Perhaps I took it a little too literally because I actually did call into work today just so I could do this for you guys right here, just so I could tell this man's story. This was something that I wanted to do that means something to me. And even though, yeah, I probably could be and should be at work, I decided, you know what? No, this, this means more to me than anything. This is something that I never thought that I would be doing on my show getting to talk about, talk to, and hear from Paul Sub, the guy who gave KISS, my favorite band, their very first club gig. Uh, again, this is a name that you don't really hear in KISS history. Everybody knows Neil. Everybody knows Bill. We know J.R. Smalling, and we know John Hart, and you know Richie and Kenny, and uh, all these guys, uh, Bob Ezrin, but you know we know Sid Benjamin, the guy that you know let KISS play at the... At the Daisy, the owner of Daisy Club, but how many people know Paul Sub, the man who opened the Coventry Club, owned the Coventry Club, and gave bands like Kiss, the New York Dolls, the Hearts of 42nd Street, the Bratz, Isis, Joey Ramone, Link Ray, and so many others. Satan, even Satan himself, look it up. Uh, even Satan, you know, <laughs> all these, all these um, original New York acts. Uh, he gave them a place to play and gave them a stage to play on. And so um, thank you to Charlie and to Allie. Thank you, Paul, for this incredible opportunity. And thank you, Kiss Army, for choosing to listen to this episode and watch along. I hope you guys learned something. I hope this was just as valuable to you as it was to me. And um, I'm not really going to do too much else on this episode because I wanted the focus to obviously be on uh, Paul Sub himself and um, his story and how it relates to history and just yeah wow there was a lot packed in here so hopefully I did a good job this was a lot of research a lot going into this but the only thing I'm really going to do after this is of course show some KISS merch typically at the end of an episode I show what's new in my KISS collection today I'm not doing that uh, today I'm just going to go right to KISS merch of the year this is a segment I've been doing now for I don't even know how many episodes um, maybe 20 or so, at least 10 or 20 episodes. But basically, I just did a little fun segment I do at the end where I show some KISS merch from my collection that coincides with the same year as our episode number. And it was easy in the 90s because it was, you know, episode 93, 94, 95. Well, show something from the 90s. Now that we're in episode, what, this is 103, I need to show something from 03, 2003. And um, what? <laughs> there is nothing else for me to show other than what we got from our first KISS concert on August 17th, 03. So this is the ticket that Jeb and I, this is my ticket, Jeb has his. I think I have also have dads down there, but yeah, so this is my first KISS ticket from my first KISS concert. I'm so glad that I still have this and that it's in good shape. You guys may have seen me um, open some stuff recently on the podcast from uh, KISS tickets from previous shows uh, before my lifetime. Well, um, here's one that I actually was alive for. Um, alive for. <laughs> no, um, this was my first KISS ticket for my first KISS concert right there. Lucky to have that. And then Dad bought this little KISS keychain, which, you know, it's just a little keychain. So nothing, you know, too special there, except for the fact that, again, you know, it's just one more uh, memento from my first KISS concert. This was when KISS was, hey, we mentioned Aerosmith a minute ago. This is the co-headlining tour with Aerosmith. This is when Aerosmith and KISS... We're um, headlining together in the summer and fall of 03. And so, yeah, this is really cool. It was the World Domination Tour for KISS. 
It was the Roximus Maximus tour for Aerosmith. I don't even, that's a, the lamest name I ever heard. But yeah, so here we go. Kiss World Domination Tour 03, 04. Ticket, keychain, and then I also have my dad's tour shirt from that show. And I love this thing more now than ever. I mean, again, this is more than 20. My first Kiss show was more than 20 years ago. I don't like to think about that. I think I'm getting old now officially. But uh, yeah, looking at this shirt, I can kind of tell too. It's really beat up. But yeah, there you go. I mean, I love the Kiss Alive aesthetic, um, keeping the original vibe there. Uh, this was Tommy Thayer's first tour with the band, uh, so it was great to see Tommy live for the first time. I think Dad tried to pass it off as Ace because he wasn't sure how we would feel as young Kiss fans. You know, you know, oh, it's Peter, Chris, Gene, and Paul. You know, they want to see Ace, but I think we kind of knew that it wasn't Ace, especially since we already saw. I think we had already seen you know, that um, Kiss Alive Symphony by then, maybe, but um, I don't know, either way, it's just, uh, yeah, I wanted to show some stuff from 03, uh, from the World Domination Tour, as a matter of fact, it relates to this too, because Paul Sub got to meet Kiss on that tour, uh, backstage during one of their meet and greets, that was the first tour they did meet and greets for, and I think he even brought his uh, grandson with him, but yes, Paul Sub got to uh, meet Kiss, and uh, again, for the first time since those original 70s days, and they recognized him. They said, I know who you are, you know, and they brought him up and um, got a picture with him. And so that was that was really cool um, to to see that as well. And so I thought that'd be cool to bring up in conjunction with this. But yeah, again, I know lots of uh, connections here today, lots of history, but it's been a lot of fun. And so I thank you guys for joining me on this episode. Again, if you want to hear the full uncut, unedited um, interview with Paul Sub. You can check that out on our Patreon. Uh, thank you guys for subscribing to our Patreon. We are uh, slowly climbing and it's been great uh, posting some exclusive videos for you guys. Um, I cannot wait to uh, continue the um, early Kiss Club days over there on Patreon. But uh, either way, this right here has been fantastic. I never thought that we would be doing this kind of episode on our show. Honestly, I just thought, you know what? We're young KISS fans. We're going to start a KISS podcast. We're going to talk about what we want to talk about. We're going to stay in our lane and, and just do what we want to do. Um, and I mean, I'm still doing what I want to do, but to have this kind of opportunity is uh, fantastic. So hopefully you guys learned something like I did. This is absolutely fantastic. And so I think I'm going to leave it right there. The focus only needs to be on Paul Sub, early KISS. So thank you, KISS fans, for joining me. Um, I'll be back in episode 104 next week. And I'm not really sure yet what I wanted. I have two possible ideas for what I want to do next week. But uh, yeah, who knows? Have to just wait and see. Either way, like and subscribe. Follow us on social media. Got some great posts over there. You guys are awesome. I've been getting lots of cool messages and comments from everybody. Um, so hopefully you guys are having as much fun as I am. And I'm going to finish this money bag soda. Put this together and get this up for you guys as soon as possible. So thank you so much for joining me on episode 103 of the Kiss Army Things podcast. My name is Xander. Take care. Peace out.